What up YouTube, Lewin here, and today we're disassembling these. Now, these are a set of radio control tanks that battle each other with infrared LEDs. They're incredibly fun to play with, and we're gonna take them apart and see what makes them tick. Here we can see the tanks out of the box with an Australian coin for scale, and obviously the first thing you notice is they are absolutely tiny. Now, in 2017, this isn't really anything too surprising, but around the turn of the millennium was when these toys really first started to hit the market. So looking closer at the tank, we can see it has a stalk here for radio control and a little plastic dome for receiving infrared signals to indicate that it's been shot by the other tank. Next to it, we can see this little infrared emitter, which is used for shooting at other tanks. We have rubber tank treads, which are very awesome and come off quite easily. And the driven wheels are actually at the rear. On the bottom, we have an on off switch and a port for connecting it to the transmitter for charging. It's all fairly basic stuff. Now, as far as the little infrared gun is concerned, if you've ever used a TV remote, you know you don't really have to point it too closely at the TV. You can basically aim it anywhere in the room and the TV will change channel. It's the same thing here. Now, these are obviously supposed to be tanks that fire down the line, but if the tanks are far enough away from each other, you can actually be significantly off axis and still actually get a kill. You can imagine the beam that that shoots out is actually quite wide and gets wider over distance. That kind of rules the gameplay a little bit. Now, what I like to do to counteract this is wrap up a tube of black electrical tape and put it around the emitter. That makes it a lot more difficult to shoot off axis. It just makes the tanks feel a lot more realistic. Now, if you want to know what it's like to actually play with these things, there's a playtest video I've linked down in the description. But for now, let's tear it apart. So we'll start by taking off the treads, which is easy enough. And you can see there's a Phillips head screw just in there and one on the other side. So we'll go ahead and undo those. Not the easiest to get to. Ah, oh, there's actually two on each side, but we'll get it done. The trick with the Phillips head screw that's hard to undo, press hard in. It helps stop the driver camming out of the screw and stripping the head. And with the screws undone, it's starting to come apart. Now we don't just want to rip this top off because often in toys like this, there'll be wires going between the two halves that are very delicate and easy to break. So being careful is the key. Now, what have we got here? Ah, yes. We can see straight away, other than the antenna, there is a little bundle of wires going up to the turret, which we will have to deal with. Twist that away. And that is actually connected to the main board with this connector here. So that will actually be relatively easy to remove, one would imagine. So go ahead and undo that. And then it's just the antenna wire, which we should be able to feed through. A bit of wriggling, come on. Slowly feeding the antenna wire through. That's good enough for now. And we can see the main board now right away. Here is our little LiPo battery. Ah, oh, I was wrong. I was very wrong. That is embarrassing. It's actually running off nickel metal hydride. Two nickel metal hydride cells, 2.4 volts. That is amazing. I thought, honestly, Given the year being 2017 and the amount of playtime I actually get out of these, it would have been LiPo because in the playtest, we charged these things up for 10 minutes and we played with them for well over an hour. Not continuously, of course, but the tanks just kept going and going and going. And I so surely thought it would have been a lithium polymer cell, but no, nickel metal hydride. So that is amazing. So we will go ahead and lift that out. That's just held in with some double-sided tape. And you want to be very careful here because there is a wire delicately stuck to it. We'll try and peel that away. You've got to be really, really slow and gentle when you're taking things like this apart because otherwise you'll just ruin them. Okay, there's a screw holding the PCB in. We'll go ahead and remove that. And shake it out. There we go. Now it's interesting, the charge port here is actually on its own PCB at 90 degrees to the main board. I reckon that's done because it was cheaper to make that interim piece of circuit board than it was to find a charge socket that actually fitted what they wanted to do. That's absolutely amazing that that's the way it works out. Now it looks like at the back here, we have 
two sets of wires. So that'll be to drive the two motors that connect to the two gearboxes that connect to the two wheels. Because the way this tank works is there's a motor for one side and a motor for the other. Depending on the speeds you run each side, depends on whether the tank goes straight, turns left or right, reverses, etc. So looking incredibly closely, we can see there is a motor on top here driving the left track. And very much in the bottom there, there is the cog from a motor underneath driving the other track. What I don't quite understand is what this magnet wire is doing. It's attached to the body of the motor and I don't understand why. So we're gonna try and take it apart further and see if that helps our understanding. Naturally, as soon as we did that, pieces went everywhere, but we can now get a better look at the drivetrain. So we have a motor on the bottom, a motor on the top, a screw which is now stuck and this magnet wire. So we're not getting any answers looking at the drivetrain side of things and we are losing a lot of cogs. Let's instead look at where the magnet wire goes. Now they both go to ground. How interesting. That could just be to reduce EMF, but that really sounds like a cop out. To be honest, I really don't understand why you need to ground the cases of the motors doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you already have two wires. There'd be an H bridge on this chip for driving the motors forward and backwards so you can go forward, backwards, and also spin the tank around. I don't understand why the case of the motor has to be grounded unless it's for some strange noise reason. But at the same time, it's hard to imagine why such a little motor would create so much noise as to be a problem. If you know why, throw it down in the comments and tell me why I'm missing something perfectly obvious. Now, as far as the drivetrain goes, this is obviously a small, very lightweight toy, probably weighs far less than 100 grams all up. That means you don't need a whole lot of ball bearings or anything special in a drivetrain like you would in a power tool, for example. All we have here is metal shafts riding in the actual case itself. The bearing surface is actually molded in to the case of the toy and the shaft simply runs in those grooves. This is an example of incredibly efficient engineering in that the body of the tank itself serves as part of the gearbox structure. It's pretty cool and if you're intending to design toys as cheaply and effectively as possible, you should definitely consider using these kind of techniques yourself. So looking more closely at the PCB, one of the first things that jumps out at us is this LM358. Now I'm not some career elec eng that can just make these guesses by inspection, but there's a couple of clues that sort of make me think this way. Number one, the chip is very close to the battery. Sounds silly, but sometimes these things make sense. Number two, this being a nickel metal hydride battery, not a lithium, I wouldn't really be too surprised if that's just a chip that sort of cuts off when this nickel metal hydride battery gets to a particular voltage. Just, just a guess, but that's what I reckon that's there for. This chip here on the other side of the board, this is fairly obviously the chip running the whole show, partly just because it's the biggest. You know, you just know these things. Now this would be running radio communication, the infrared setup, I would say, and also obviously, it's almost certainly connected to the motors here one way or another. Now, whether this chip is an ASIC or a microcontroller that's been programmed is kind of hard to say, but I would be leaning towards the latter because it's pretty expensive to do custom silicon. Trying to figure out what kind of microcontroller it is is very difficult because not only are there no numbers on the case, it doesn't even look like they've been filed off. It just looks like they were never there to begin with. So that could be some really obscure, strange microcontroller from God knows where. One way to learn more about it would be to decap it, but that's a little outside the scope of what we're doing today. Flipping back over, we have these two little chips here. Now these are almost certainly RH bridge motor drivers. I say that because there's two of them and we have two motors. And in addition, we don't have any other obvious motor drivers or big transistors, and they're right next to the pads that connect to the motor as well. So that's pretty much a done deal. That also makes me suspect that these two little packages are perhaps some kind of snubbing diode, but that actually wouldn't make any sense because the motor is reversible. So not exactly sure what those might be. Actually, they're probably caps to help reduce spikes in a different way. So that's sort of all your main active silicon. We have these here, which are probably more transistors or potentially a regulator, but who's to say? Looks like a protection diode here as well, but Again, can't really tell. Now with the mysteries of the PCB largely known to us, let's take a look at what's in the turret. Now to actually get this turret apart is a little difficult. We can see there's a screw holding things together, but it is presumably under here. So we may have to 
split this apart and we will try not to break it doing so. There we go. There we go. Now, when we took that apart, you may notice we split what looks like four little pins that held it all together. Thankfully, this isn't a complicated toy. We can just stick that back on with super glue, but it is a destructive process to take it apart. Now with this apart, it's pretty simple to tell what's going on. We have the status LED, we have the infrared LED for shooting at other tanks, and then here we have an infrared receiver. Now this receives light that has been caught by this plastic dome and diffuses down in here so that the tank can be shot from all angles. Now this is a three-legged device, which suggests to me it's one of those proper infrared receivers that filters out anything other than the properly modulated signals, which are usually around 38 kilohertz. Now the whole reason of using a modulated infrared signal at many kilohertz is it stops your system from picking up aberrant signals from things like light bulbs or halogens or the sun, all of which put out infrared light. You don't want infrared light from those sources to falsely trigger this setup. So you use a modulated signal because it's incredibly unlikely that the sun is going to start flashing 38,000 times a second. And if it does, you've got bigger problems than your remote control tanks not working. So that's why this is a three-legged device. It's not just a photodiode in there. There's actually a little bit of active electronics that helps filter things out, I do believe. But that's all it is, fundamentally. So we've got five wires here. One will be a ground, one will be power, and the other three will probably talk to the other devices. A couple of support passives there, but that's really all she wrote. Now, if we reassemble it, you can see that the turret can actually turn. Now, that may seem silly because it's not powered or controllable during the game. However, it does have some strategic implications. Let's demonstrate with an example. We have the Soviet tank here trying to shoot at the German tank there. To try and shoot from behind cover, the tank must first drive out, turn, fire, and then back away, turning at the same time. It's a very complicated maneuver which requires some incredibly careful driving, which, if you've watched our other video, is easier said than done. However, let's change things. If we put the tank turret at 45 degrees, we can instead move forward, fire at the enemy tank, and reverse behind cover instantly, simply by going in forward and reverse. It allows us to use the cover far more effectively without unduly exposing the tank and it completely changes the strategic options when you're fighting this way. So I think it is actually pretty cool that they let you set the tanks up in the way you want for different kind of game scenarios. Now, these tanks are a great example of just how far miniaturization has come. Even with fairly simple technology by modern standards, it's really impressive how much they do with such little space. The great thing about this miniaturization is that it enables a whole raft of remote control toys to exist that simply weren't even conceivable 20 to 30 years ago. If you want to actually see what these things are like to play with, check out my playtest linked in the description below. And otherwise, till next time, thanks for watching. Luan out. Now the real question is, can I get all this back together? All right. Wish me luck. Oh my God, it still works. Awesome.